So we're starting a new unit, introducing this um, new type of analysis, this new test called ANOVA. These are the learning objectives. Describe the basic purpose of an ANOVA test, recognize the, the hypotheses. Um, for a one-way ANOVA, we'll talk about other <clears throat> kinds of ANOVAs later. And this third learning objective described the effects of performing multiple comparisons using two sample t-tests. That's really just kind of a providing a rationale for why do we need an ANOVA. And we'll talk about mean square within, mean square between groups, which will become more important later on. So just to illustrate that ANOVA is something that you see very commonly in the literature. It's used a lot. It is the probably the most widely used, well, it's the most widely used statistical test according to your textbook, and I believe that. This is an example of a study that I just came across studying patients in China with COVID-19, and one way ANOVA was used to assess differences between three groups. I can't remember what the, uh, the different groups were, but for some different measures like levels of different proteins in their blood. They have these different uh, means with the standard deviation listed here. And in this column here, this is a p-value. Some of these are p-values associated with ANOVAs if they're dealing with means. And some are um, Fisher's exact test um, for, for categorical data. You can see a lot of them are, are not significant, but there are This is just a, a snippet of that table. There are others that are. And ones that are significant, this indicates the difference among groups one through four. Okay, so ANOVA is used to examine differences between groups, between group averages. <clears throat> so what is what is ANOVA? It sounds cool and sciencey, like maybe it reminds you of the NOVA science program that's on PBS. It stands for Analysis of Variance. And it's used to assess differences between two or more means. So we already have a test to assess the differences between two means, a two-sample t-test. There's also a matched pairs test if they're, if they're paired, if it's using paired data. And this is basically if you have more than two. And it can go, it can, you can have a large number. Now, the null hypothesis should look um, familiar to you because it's structured just the same as the one for a two-sample t-test. Mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3 um, equals mu4 all the way up to however many means you have. Okay, so that the population means um, for all the groups are the same. <clears throat> and then the alternative hypothesis is a little lame, but it's just that at least one of the means is different. Um, null hypothesis, they're all the same. Um, null hypothesis, at least one is going to differ from another one. That could be one is different than two, one is different than three, four is different than two. Any combination, um, any any pairwise comparison is going to reveal a difference. Okay. So if we're looking at differences between means. Why not just do a bunch of two-sample t-tests? So you could, in theory, do a two-sample t-test comparing group one to group two, and then group one to group three, group one to group four, and then group two to group three, group two to group four, and then group three to group four. So that would be, I don't know, like eight um, two-sample t-tests. It would be a lot. But, you know, computers are fast. Why not just do a bunch of those? So here is a comic that illustrates this, um, the issues with this, okay? So say somebody comes to a scientist with a claim, jelly beans um, cause acne, scientists go investigate. They go back and they say, they do some studies, they do like a two sample t-test, maybe people who measuring the amount of acne on someone's face among those who eat jelly beans and then compared to those who do not eat jelly beans. And they did not find a statistically significant difference. The p-value is greater than 0.05. Okay. <clears throat> so they think that settles that. Oh, well, I hear it's only a certain color that causes it. 
So they do purple, P greater than 0.05, not statistically significant. Brown, same. Pink, same. Blue, teal, salmon, red, turquoise, magenta, yellow. Gray, tan, cyan, green. Whoa, P is less than 0.05. Mauve, beige, lilac, black, peach, orange, all the same. So this makes headlines green jelly beans linked to acne. Now, hopefully you're seeing some problems with this. Remember, a p-value represents a probability. Okay, so there's some roll of the dice elements to it. It's the probability of observing a test statistic as or more extreme than the one that you observed, like a t statistic as or more extreme than the one that you observed, if the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so maybe the null hypothesis is true. A uh, null hypothesis in this case would be um, there's no difference between in an acne between those who eat green jelly beans and those who don't. Okay, so there's no difference. But there's a 5% chance, um, based on your alpha level, you're willing to accept a 5% chance um, that you will reject the null hypothesis with the p-value lower than 0.05, even if it is true, okay, a type 1 error. There's a 5% chance of a type 1 error. Okay, now there's a 5% chance associated with every single one of these tests. You do that enough and that 0.05 is going to add up. Here's 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15. Eventually it's gonna be a pretty good chance that you're going to find um, uh, a test statistic, statistic that's extreme enough to reject the null hypothesis, <clears throat> even though it really is true. Okay, so this is the issue of multiple comparisons. This is something that you'll see in multiple contexts in, in statistics. Doing multiple t-tests, or you know, there are other ways that um, multiple comparisons can occur, but if you do multiple two-sample t-tests, it inflates your chances of committing a type one error, thinking that you found a difference that really isn't there. So you need some way to do it all in one shot, and that way is ANOVA. Okay, now analysis of variance. Why is it called analysis of variance? You may think, hey, we're comparing means, right? We're not comparing variance. So here are some tables um, from the textbook and I'll kind of break these down and then I've recreated these in Excel with some formulas that show you these same numbers um, to illustrate the types of variance that we're actually analyzing in ANOVA. Okay, so this is just some made up data. We've got group one, group two, group three, these are the means, and these are the sample standard deviations um, for each one. Okay, there's also a grand mean if you were to like add all of these numbers up and divide by uh, 27. Okay, there's nine in each group. Okay, and then there's some numbers down here, and I'll introduce these two terms in just a sec. You've got the MS error and the MS group. Okay, now the MS error this is calculated this way. So you can see this is 10 plus 10 plus 7.75 divided by three. So this is the average of the sample standard deviations across all three groups, okay? And that gives you 9.25, okay? Now this um, is, the MS group is calculated a little bit differently. It's N times S sub X bar Okay, um, now S sub X bar you calculate in this way. This is the, the variance, the standard deviation squared um, of the X bars, okay? Um, so you take each of them, subtract the grand mean, maybe this reminds you of calculating the standard deviation. It's basically the, the average distance of each of these means from the grand mean, okay? And then squaring it. Um, to get the variance, okay? Remember the variance is the standard deviation squared. Okay, so you get that and that is one. And then to get this MS group, which is mean square of the group, mean square group, and this is mean square error, um, you multiply that by the sample size of each of the groups, which is nine, okay? Now, you'd only calculate it this way if all the sample sizes are the same. Um, we may talk about later if the, you know, what you do if the sample sizes are different, but you, you probably wouldn't calculate this by hand um, in, in any cases. But these are terms that you're going to see in an output, so I want you to know what they mean. 
And then the other thing to notice here is that 9.25 and 9, these two are about the same, okay? Now here's a new scenario. Now notice the standard deviations here are the same, um, but we've changed the means, okay? We got 6.334, 5.33. Here we got 8, 3, and 5. So these means are more different from each other than the other one. Now, notice up here, this is the case in which the null hypothesis is true, okay? That there, there really is no difference between the three means. And here, null is false, okay? We've calculated these numbers in the same way, but now we've got a big difference between 57, you know, the MS group and the, um, the MS error, the mean square error and mean square group. 9.25 versus 57, okay? So this difference here is what provides evidence against the null hypothesis, okay? So here's kind of what's going on. The MS within or the MS error, um, the mean square error, um, and the MS between groups or the MS groups, um, MS treatment, um, this represents the average variance within each group, okay? So this is a good estimate of the population variance um, using these sample standard deviations, whether the null hypothesis is true um, or not, whether or not the means are equal. So in that first scenario, the null hypothesis is true. In the other scenario, the null hypothesis was false, but you see that the, the number stayed the same. It was still 9.25. Okay, the variance of the sample means, um, this is, you know, calculated um, where you take, you plug in the sample means here, get the variance, and then multiply it by the sample size. That is a good estimate of the population variance only if the null hypothesis is true. Basically, if the means are all equal, mathematically, it's going to work out about the same. You can average the three st standard deviations um, from the samples, or you can um, take the sample means and find a measure of the, the, the variance between those and then multiply it by the sample size. And there's more proofs and stuff under the hood that I won't get into, and they're kind of over my head. Um, but that is going to work out to be about the same if the, the means are actually equal if the null hypothesis is true, okay? So if these two MSs, the MS within and the MS, MS within groups, basically, and the MS between groups are about equal, then there's not much evidence that the null is true, okay? So next I will, um, so you can see here 9.25 versus nine, um, that's good evidence that the null is true, which it is. <laughs> and here, since there's a big difference, that's good evidence that the null is false. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to end this video and I'll re, um, I'll show this table again in Excel, um, as well as an ANOVA output, which I won't get into how to do that yet. We'll talk about that next time. Um, but showing, um, how all of these figures were, were calculated just to kind of reinforce that. Okay, so the main things to, to take away is being able to um, define what each of these are, the MS within and the MS between groups, um, and knowing that if they're about equal, if they come out about equal, then there's not much evidence that the null is true. You will see these numbers pop up in, a, in an ANOVA output, and so just being able to describe what those are.